I am uh, Yannis Berlich, the director of the National Defense Academy Center for Security and Strategic Research. Uh, it is a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Lieutenant Colonel Sandor Fabian, who will give us today what's promised to be a wonderful lecture on how should small states defend themselves. So, Sandor, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Labrit, good morning, everybody. Uh, Director Bergens, thank you very much for this great opportunity and for the invitation to talk to you today uh, about uh, a topic, uh, what I've researched for more than uh, two years. Uh, when I did my master's degree in the United States of America at the Naval Postgraduate School in a department called Defense Analysis. And uh, within that department, I focused on special operations in law intensity conflicts and irregular warfare. And as part of uh, that master's program, uh, like every student, I was uh, required to write a thesis, a master's thesis, on a contemporary uh, military or strategic uh, issue. And uh, I chose to kind of take a hard look on the different strategy of small states. And I convinced this uh, professor, his name is John Arquila, to be my thesis advisor. And uh, with him for 15 months, uh, I managed to, to put together a, a thesis. He is very famous, uh, uh, irregular warfare subject matter expert, and his most famous quote, it takes a network to fight a network, which was basically a fundamental principle for the counterinsurgency operations, both in Iraq and Afghanistan in the, in the recent conflicts. So with him, uh, we put together a, a thesis, which uh, turned out to be uh, very good. It uh, received an outstanding thesis award at the Naval Postgraduate School. And later, it was uh, published as a paperback book uh, in the United States called uh, Irregular Warfare, the Future Military Strategy for Small States. When I talk about irregular warfare, please be advised that I'm not talking about uh, any uh, doctrinal terminology. For me, irregular warfare means non-traditional, non-conventional warfare. And you will see what I, I mean by that. As I described to you, uh, this is a research. I'm a Hungarian military officer, and also at the same time, I'm working for NATO right now at the NATO Special Operations Headquarters. And this, what I'm going to present, is my own personal uh, academic research. It has nothing to do with uh, the Hungarian military or NATO or the NATO Special Operations Headquarters, for sure. OK, I have one uh, ground rule for you today. Hopefully, you heard this uh, expression many times, think outside of the box. So when you are listening to me today, please don't do that. You have to do something else for me. Think without the box. What I'm going to present to you today is always get a very mixed uh, reaction from my audience. 50% of the people saying it isn't worth the paper you wrote it on. So your words are basically useless, and it's no way even parts is useful for anybody. Another 50% is saying, yeah, it's a kind of good idea. Maybe elements could be useful for us uh, in, in our national or international uh, <clears throat> environment. That's what I'm trying to do today for you, is to present my idea, my research. And hopefully, the only thing I will do to make you think and maybe take some of my ideas, some of my principles, and further develop it and come up with very good idea and detailed solution for problems. So please think without the box today. OK, as I said, I had to put together a thesis, and when I went uh, out to search for ideas, what should I discuss, uh, I had a couple of very uh, important uh, things I uh, took as a baseline for myself. One is Raimondo Montacuccoli said once, you know, war requires three things, money, money, money. Resources, resources, resources. And then this very famous gentleman, Sir Winston Churchill said, gentlemen, we ran out of money, so maybe it's time to think to come up some kind of alternative solution. And the other thing is, based on my career and what I've seen, uh, the 21st century conflict environment and uh, the strategy, the how we develop military strategies, I started to believe that the current military strategies, the associated military organizations and doctrine, the military hardware are obsolete and irrelevant in the 21st century. So based on this three major fundamental uh, lines, I went out and uh, started to do some uh, research. 
And since I'm myself coming from a small state, I was really interested in small state strategies. So first of all, I tried to define what small state is. So, <coughs> excuse me. In the definition of small state, I used many uh, resources, but uh, there were three basic uh, researchers or scholars who kind of defined uh, my understanding of, of the small state. The first is Hakan Wiberg and his book, The Security of Small Nations, Challenges and Differences. He said, when you define a small state, you can have two definitions. One is absolute and the other one is rational. Relational, sorry. So I quote him. Uh, for an absolute definition, he says, indicators of size, such as population, area, GDP, military capability, etc., and attempts are then made to correlate other variables with the size indicators. From a definition, relational definition perspective, he says, the essence of smallness is either a lack of influence on the environment or high sensitivity to the environment and lack of immunity against influence from it or both of it. And the other person is Robert Rostein and his uh, book called Alliances and Small Powers. He said, a small power is a state that recognizes it cannot obtain security primarily by the use of its own forces and own capabilities, and it must rely on fundamentally on the aid of the other states, institutions, processes, and developments to do so. And the third one is Michael E. Handel, Weak States in the International Systems. And he said, a small state is a state which is unable to contend in war with the great powers on anything like equal terms. So based on three, is this three major resources, I probably took one step further and I said, a small state can be any state, including the US, Canada, Russia, China, whatever, which considers itself as a small state in a future possible conflict based on the future possible adversary the state is actually faces. So in my world, in my mind, the small state can be anybody who can uh, look at himself or herself as a small state. For uh, the small state strategies, I took uh, Kenneth Waltz and his theory of international politics. And he said that in the current competitive international environment, states socialize to similar strategies. And he continued that the fate of each state depends on its response to what the other states do. And the possibility that a conflict will be conducted by force leads to the competition in the arts and the instruments of force. The competition produces tendency toward the sameness of the competitors. What does it mean? It's basically if one state is developing a capability, the other is cap developing the same capability, and they get into the a sameness competition. Based on that, I researched uh, the possible strategies what uh, states and small states can use uh, for their defenses, and I found basically four fundamental group of possible strategies. The first one is they are trying to imitate a major power, basically uh, taking the same military organization and trying to imitate the same way. So if uh, the possible future adversary has air forces, land forces, naval forces, Marine Corps, then uh, the smaller states are trying to imitate those capabilities. My problem with that, of course, uh, acknowledging all the benefits and uh, advantages of all these, all, all these uh, strategies, my problem with that, this is very, very much resource in in incentive. E getting into a competition with a, small, with a bigger state based on traditional uh, military organizations and military hardware, it's very much impossible to afford, very much impossible to sustain on, on the long term. The other possibility is to join an alliance. Again, I did acknowledge all the benefits, all the advantages. My two key problems uh, to my research with the alliances is called the abandonment and the entrapment. Alliances, when they work, and when they worked in the history, they were great, of course, but always uh, the problem of abandonment and uh, uh, entrapment was uh, present. What do I mean by that? When a small state solely rely defensive strategies on an outside entity, an alliance, to support it and ensure the, 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 alliance, uh, the, the defensive capabilities, if 
the alliance fails for whatever reason, the small state has nothing else really to uh, uh, put on the table. And the other thing is the entrapment is when the state has to get into a conflict which by his national interest would never get in, but because of he is a part of the alliance, he is required to join the alliance into that conflict uh, problem, and that's going to require more resources, human life, hardware, etc. The third traditional approach, what I found is a, na a nation, a state assumes neutrality. It's also a, a possible solution, but uh, the problem with that, everybody else, future adversaries, has to respect that neutrality. And throughout history, uh, it was always, you know, when one nation respected neutrality, another one, based on strategic interest or personal gains or whatever, they just did not uh, respect it. So again, based, based the national defense uh, strategy based on neutrality, I don't uh, think is the right solution. And the fourth is basically basing the national defensive approach on the acquisition of uh, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, the problem with that in the current international environment, it's very hard to do it. You have to have, again, the resources, you have to have uh, the, the expertise, and uh, you have to face international sanctions and the response from international uh, community. At the same time, even if you manage to do all those and, and got to, together, uh, got through all these problems, you have to have the will to use those weapons of mass destruction, which is, again, a very, very uh, important uh, question. And of course, any combination of those four is uh, also a possibility uh, for, for a small nation. <coughs> so I said, okay, this is the four big groups, uh, and I, as I said, acknowledging the, the benefits and, and the advantages, I said, still, I have issues with that. So what alternative, uh, what alternative can be uh, applied besides these four? Is there anything else we could use uh, uh, for future uh, military strategy as, as a baseline. And when I went out to do my research, I found this uh, scholar, Ivan Aragorn Toft, and his uh, article or research called How the Weak Wins War. Uh, basically, he's talking about uh, the end game, the results in an asymmetric conflict. And he and his research team uh, did a research on every conflict between 1800 and 1998. They used a mathematical model to determine who is the strong actor and who is the weak actor. I don't have time uh, to explain that, but if you go Google it, uh, the article is uh, available on the internet and you can understand it. But anyway, they identified that between 1800 and 1998, the conflicts, in every conflict, almost 71%, so more than two-thirds of the conflict were won by the, by the strong actor. I don't think it's a surprise uh, for anybody. Yes, but then what they did, they divided these 200 years to four 50-year periods, and what they could see is in the first 50 years, the win on the strong actor side was overwhelming, almost 89%. But as we progress towards the, the year 2000, you can see that during the last 50 years, 55% of the conflicts were won by the weaker side, and only 45% were actually uh, won by the stronger side. So basically, what they found is the final outcome of any conflict is a result of the interaction of the adversary strategies. What kind of strategy the both sides or multiple sides are using. And what they said is all things being equal and getting everything together, two distinctive forms of strategies can be identified the one so-called the direct strategies and the so-called the indirect strategies. And basically, they ended up with a two-player uh, game theory, mathematical game in this uh, respect. So they went back to the conflicts, and they tried to identify now who win based on the interaction of those strategies. And what they found is when the strong actor and the weak actor use the same approach, 76% of the time, the strong actor won the conflict. But when they used an opposite approach, then 63% of the times, always 63% of the times, the win actor actually won the conflict. So using an opposite approach drastically increases your chance as a weak actor to win in a conflict. <coughs> so based on my, my research, I took, okay, 
this is a fact. I accepted that this is a fact as, as my basic assumption for my research. So I revisited the question of conflict participants are going towards the sameness in their competition. And I said, if Ivan, Ivan Aragorn Toft is right, then a small state or the weak actor should stop pursuing the principle of sameness and we have to go to the opposite or the difference and open it up as much as possible. Make the difference as big as possible to further increase the chance of uh, winning in a conflict. And I have uh, multiple sources just uh, confirmed and, and more and more convinced me that uh, this is uh, one of the possible ways uh, for small states to pursue in, in a future uh, uh, defensive strategy approach. But I also have a couple key quotations or principles you can uh, think about uh, when, when you uh, think about this problem. In 1975, uh, an American colonel called Harry Summers, he flew to North Vietnam as, as a member of a negotiating party. And at the airport, he got into a conversation with a North Vietnamese colonel called Colonel Tu. And the American colonel said, you know, you never ever defeated us on the battlefield. And the North Vietnamese colonel said, that's right, but it's also irrelevant. It was irrelevant, perfectly irrelevant from the end result. Samuel P. Huntington, uh, probably most of you know him, uh, a very uh, <coughs> uh, famous thinker. He said, I think in uh, the early 1990s, the biggest challenge for the former Warsaw Pact countries how to modernize and how not to westernize their militaries. It's also, I think, a key possible angle if we start to think about that or, or understand that, that issue. And uh, B.H. Liddellhart, again, a strategic thinker, he said, in almost all decisive campaign in history, the dislocation of the enemy's psychological and physical balance has been the vital prelude to the successful attempt at his overthrow. The dislocation has been produced by a strategic indirect approach. John Orquilla, my mentor, my thesis advisor, his recent book uh, called The Insurgents, Raiders and Bandits, How the Masters of Irregular Warfare Have Shaped Our World. And he interestingly notes in, in his book that the Pentagon reflects a curious lack of attention to the idea that irregular warfare may be employed by a standing military in a general military conflict. And the fifth uh, point I would like to raise is the comp contemporary conflicts in Iraq and uh, in, in uh, Afghanistan. Looking at the success or possible success of the activities of the insurgents in both countries in the recent years, I started to ask the question from myself, what if they would have been organized, equipped, trained and supported from the beginning or before the conflict to wage such war what they are waging right now. Because everything they are doing is basically ad hoc and the organization, the support, the training, everything is happening during the conflict from, from scratch. I ask the question for myself, what if there is an organization existing, trained, selected, equipped, supported and prepared to wage such kind of war? So I went out and I established three hypotheses. First, I said, during an invasion of its territory, a small state has a better chance to defeat a numerically and technologically superior enemy when utilizing irregular warfare techniques instead of a traditional military methods or approaches. My second hypothesis was irregular warfare strategy is more effective when the irregular defense force contains and led by professional members. What I mean is people who 24 seven training for such kind of uh, warfare, for such kind of uh, uh, defensive approach. And my third hypothesis was irregular warfare strategy is more effective when the defense force is organized, trained, equipped for irregular war before the conflict rather than when it arises ad hoc in the wake of the conventional defeat. To kind of test my idea and the hypothesis, I uh, went to take a look at six case studies. 
And I chose the case studies for both failed and also successful cases because I didn't want to cherry pick only the successful cases to kind of, uh, you know, prove my, my own idea. So the first two case studies I chose, and the, the case studies are coming from different historical times and different locations, so I'm not focusing in a time period or for a certain geographical location. So the first two is the American Revolutionary War and the Boer War. I chose those two uh, cases because it, they were very good to not even existing states, but for sure not existing military organizations. They had to rely on their irregular, irregular uh, capabilities from the beginning of, uh, of the conflict. And uh, they had to hold out with those capabilities against the best military power at that time, Great Britain. And then they had time to actually uh, form their conventional forces, but the irregular forces still had a major role throughout the whole conflict in, in both cases. The American Revolution War actually was a successful case, while the Boer War was uh, an absolute failure uh, from, from the, the weaker side perspective. The third uh, case study I took is the, German, the war in Germany, East Africa during First World War. It's a very interesting case because a very small 2,500 strong uh, German military force was uh, located in uh, German East Africa before the war. And when the war uh, broke out, the military leader, uh, Karl von Rettow, he immediately realized that he cannot defend uh, German West Africa with conventional techniques or using his conventional forces on a conventional way because the, the enemy surrounding him was just so overwhelming. So he decided to, he turned in the whole force into an irregular formation. He abandoned his uh, uh, conventional organizations. He reorganized the units. He reorganized the tactics, techniques, procedures. He got rid of some of the equipment. He uh, purchased new stuff or, or he got some, some new stuff. He based his full uh, defensive strategy on irregular uh, approach. The fourth uh, case study I took it was the Yugoslav partisans during the Second World War. Again, a very interesting study because uh, at that time Yugoslavia had quite a big conventional military, but it was defeated and the whole country overrun in 11 days by the Germans. And what happened after, from scratch, the Yugoslav partisans had to basically build up their organization, the training, they had to get weapons, and from that uh, they managed uh, to wage quite a successful uh, resistance uh, within, uh, within Yugoslavia. My fifth case study is the first uh, Russia-Chechen war, uh, and very close to that, the second Lebanese war. It's more contemporary cases, uh, more or less, uh, on both, and <coughs> they help me understand the uh, possibilities in a more contemporary and more modern uh, situation uh, using uh, more modern uh, uh, approaches. To actually examine these uh, case studies, I had to build a research model. First of all, to build the research model, I used some uh, major thinkers in unconventional warfare, uh, guerrilla warfare, or irregular warfare, as you like. Here is my first surprise, Karl from Kausowitz. Uh, people usually are very surprised when I talk to him as a, as a thinker of guerrilla warfare. He really had some extensive uh, uh, studies on guerrilla warfare in 1811 and 1812 when he actually taught uh, young captains at the uh, Allgemeine Kriegsschule in, in Prussia. And he famously said, uh, after understanding that Prussia was too weak to actually uh, uh, defeat the French in an open battle, he said, the alternative, whoever, should neither be a surrender nor an unholy alliance with France, but the strongest possible defense through a Spanish guerrilla war in Germany. The other guy I used was uh, Mao Zedong, of course, uh, and his work on, on guerrilla warfare. Uh, I used him uh, because his understanding of the use of guerrilla warfare and conventional warfare side by side and different phases could have a, a possible effect on my findings. So uh, that was the main reason uh, using him. And the other guy I used, of course, uh, Che Guevara uh, and his uh, work on guerrilla warfare. And the fourth guy I used is Vo Nguyen Giap, uh, general from uh, North Vietnam, who actually managed to kind of combine all those three gentlemen before him and come up with a, 
up-to-date guerrilla warfare, if I may, may say that. Uh, so these four thinkers, these four individuals were my basic uh, guidelines and their principles to build a research model to test my hypothesis. And the research model I built had uh, five uh, elements for every, every case. First, I presented the background information, basically uh, putting the reader into a historical perspective, telling uh, everybody who was the participants of the conflict, what was uh, the final outcome. And uh, second, I talked about the irregular strategy, how the weaker side used a non-traditional way of fighting in that physical, and, uh, physical location and at that time uh, of, of history. And uh, I focused uh, my attention on the strategic goals, how the irregular warfare supported those final goals, uh, and uh, so on. Sorry. So the third part of my model was organization and leadership. I took a look at the weak side organization, how much they reflected any conventional uh, influence, either the organization, the doctrine, uh, whatever, and also the leadership, how much a traditional military leader added or basically take away value from, from uh, the, the approach. Many times I found that the previous military training and understanding military and, and war helped a lot, but in other cases it was really, really a big problem that conventionally minded leaders could not adopt. They could not be flexible enough to uh, ec effectively exploit the possible uh, advantages of uh, the irregular warfare. The fourth uh, part of my research model was uh, internal factors. Internal factors, I took a look at the training, uh, the tactics, techniques, uh, the irregular uh, formations formed, and also uh, the, the role of uh, intelligence. If the irregular uh, formations had any intelligence or information superiority, or uh, they were lacking that, or if the intelligence superiority and information superiority had any great effect on the final results of, of the conflict. And my final point was the external factors. External factors, I looked at uh, the physical terrain. If the physical terrain has anything to do with the success of a possible non-traditional approach. Because uh, throughout my, my research, I many times discussed this with uh, other students, and everybody told me that, hey, what you are proposing, you can do only have, if you have high mountains, swamps, you know, deep forests, whatever. That's true. But uh, hopefully, uh, by the end of the presentation, you might uh, will have another idea. So I looked at the physical terrain, and I also looked at the social terrain, how the population support was, cru with, was crucial, or was it not really a, a changing or, or, a, or a great effect on the, on the final uh, results. And also, as part of the external factor, I also looked at a possible external power supporting uh, the irregular forces if it has a real effect on the final outcome or not, or could they sustain and maintain uh, their own uh, operational tempo without any real external uh, power supporting them. So what did I find? What I found is there is, I believe, after this research, there is an alternative uh, possible solution for small states, again, whomever consider uh, herself a small state, to pursue uh, the, the principle of difference uh, and not to pursue the, the sameness. What do you need for that? You have to have a strong unifying political, unified political will and some kind of unifying force within that state. It could be a religious-based unifying force, it could be patriotism uh, or any other unifying force that can make a society uh, really one and homogeneous uh, to pursue such, such a strategy. The other thing, you have to be open for non-traditional strategies, and uh, you have to have the will to build purpose-built forces. It's very important to have the proper leadership. As I said, former military members or, mi or, or people with military training, traditional military training, could be very, very beneficial, could be very, very uh, effective, as long as they have the, the, the capability to adopt, to be flexible, and to understand the changes and be open for changes. The effect of the physical and social terrain. I strongly believe that uh, 
It's a huge advantage, could be a huge advantage if you have swamps, if you have deep forests, if you have huge mountains, if you have all the rough physical terrain features. But I would also uh, recommend you that in the 21st century, the, the roughest terrain is already exist and it's increasing in a high uh, speed and that's called urban areas. For uh, you know, this kind of in, uh, indirect approach or, or uh, non-traditional approach, the urban area could be one of the greatest uh, uh, battlefields, if, if you uh, wish. And also, it is very important that I think we can create artificial uh, terrain, physical terrain, if it supports uh, our approach and understanding of, uh, of uh, defense. Uh, the social terrain, I think it's very important that uh, the population, as I said, the unifying factor, the population uh, has a key effect and, and, the, and the key influence on this. But also with the cyberspace, we have some very uh, new battlefields uh, available for us and using an indirect approach uh, on the exploiting the cyberspace also can create some uh, opportunities for the, for the weaker side. The fifth uh, point what I found is self-reliance and the ability for self-sustainment is very, very important. As long as small states are getting military hardware, tanks, airplanes, whatever, from outside, it's very, very hard to sustain it uh, during a conflict or uh, you know, getting the right time, the right amount, because you know, the adversaries can uh, maneuver the political space properly to kind of uh, make sure they are denying access to, to the vital resupplies. So as long as a nation or a state would like to uh, use an indirect approach, it's very important to make sure that it can, self, uh, it can rely on self and can uh, self-sustain uh, the organization and, and uh, resupply the hardware and whatever necessary. And the sixth thing is operational security. What I believe is in the conventional side right now, if you give me 10 minutes and an internet access, I can give you a very good picture on any country's military, organization, doctrine, tactics, techniques, procedures. If we go, or if a small nation decide to go to an untraditional, non-traditional, non unconventional way of, or of uh, defense, there is not going to be available information for our possible adversaries to build on, to counter on. Right now, we know everybody's uh, weak points. We can exploit that. I mean the conventional formations, but it would be very, very hard for possible adversaries for the future to kind of, you know, <clears throat> build a, a good picture, an intelligence picture on a nation which decides to pursue an untraditional uh, way of defense or understand the defense. And uh, my key takeaways for you today I would like to leave you with three key takeaways, what I believe, even if you forget everything what I said. I think in the 21st century, especially for small states, it, it is the geopolitical situation now and will be in the upcoming years when we really have to rethink how we understand defense, how a nation understands defense, and how we counter possible future adversaries. And when you are ready to rethink that defense, I think we have to be ready to do some radical changes in the military culture, organization, and doctrine associated uh, with the definition of, of defense. And with all that, we have to be ready, I believe, to move away from pursuing the high-tech stuff, always the, the best, the most advanced, the Gucci. And we have to move towards the right tech. What I mean by that, we have to decide how we want to fight, and then we develop the proper technology for that. I strongly believe that in the 21st century we are at the technological uh, development level when we can choose what we want to develop. Right now when we are introducing a fifth, sixth generation fighter, tank, artillery piece, we are running after that technology. We are creating doctrine, we are creating tactics to kind of service that new piece of equipment. I think we have to change that. I think now the revolution in military thinking have to come first and then the, 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 the technological thinking has to follow up uh, with that. And uh, that's my last uh, thought I would like to leave uh, with you from T.E. Lawrence. With 2,000 years of examples behind us, we have no excuses when fighting for not fighting well. 
We have to choose how to fight. We have enough examples. We can choose how to do it. And I think uh, the 21st century geopolitical situation is the perfect time to really hardly reconsider our understanding of uh, defense. It was uh, really quick. Uh, thank you very much for the attention. And uh, I am really ready to discuss uh, or hopefully answer any questions what you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my personal belief, it has to be a complete uh, difference or complete asymmetry, or whatever you call it. And maybe if I give you like a not too military example. So if you and I have a problem and we are going to fight it out, and I know that you are a boxer and you are demonstrating your boxing capability. You have you know, the best resources to train and uh, you, you have the best TTPs, your techniques, or whatever. For sure, I don't even want to give you a chance to use your boxing capabilities on me. So I would never go into a ring with you. I would probably wait for you in a dark street after hours and stab you in the back just to make sure that I exploit the biggest difference uh, you know, with that. It's, it's, it's a very utopistic idea in an international, current international environment, I would say probably yes. But that's why I'm saying is, what I'm trying to do is, is establish some kind of basic fundamental framework and then using a lot of smart people to maybe move it forward. But to answer your question shortly, I would say the, the complete difference or, or, or the biggest difference possible. My, my understanding or, or my, my opinion on that. Okay, I have a question more or less a uh, similar line, but please. Look, you, you explored the idea uh, and you showed the equation <coughs> that and the, 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 the price of the land applied for, for strategy that, okay, if you, that you need different strategies as week to, to win. And so, but I was thinking, look, suppose your opponent is much bigger than you are. So he has uh, conventional capabilities much more than you have. But at the same time, it, his core strategy is irregular, non conventional, asymmetric warfare. And then he can choose what to use with you very easily. And, uh, and, uh, or um, to uh, employ nonlinear asymmetric or, or go to conventional and so on. So supposing you are strong in asymmetric and linear and so on, uh, then you can just choose to go conventional. And so to explore this idea a little bit, please. Yeah, I wanted to go back if I can to To this, this slide. Uh, thank you very much for the question. It usually comes up that uh, what if a bigger enemy is choosing uh, 
a non-traditional way, or if they can uh, between switch between the two. And so he says it's, if it's the same approach, then always the stronger wins. Mm -hmm. But my take on, if you choose that your approach is going to be the non-traditional or indirect one, and then you develop it, you make sure your organization, your training, your support system, everything is based basically on that, then you as a small state will become the strong actor. Okay. And then if he chooses to take the indirect approach, it means you are both taking the indirect approach, so it's the same approach, but you are the strong actor, so you win. If he's taking the conventional approach, you're still taking your indirect approach, but from that sense, you become the weak actor again, so you win again, because then what win again? So I think if you choose the indirect approach, a proper fits your national uh, or whatever international organizational uh, needs and possibilities, resources, and you develop it to the edge to really be the, the cutting edge in, in that approach, you will have no flexibility to switch between conventional or indirect, but you will have the flexibility to be the strong or the weak actor in a conflict from, from an Ivan argument of the a problem solving issue. So that, that's what I believe. That's, that's what my research kind of suggests right now. Maybe I, of course, I'm wrong, <coughs> but uh, that's my take on and that's, that's my answer for you. That's the million dollar question, probably. Thank you very much. So, first of all, I think that's, that's of course a political question because you know, it, it has to be the political leadership who decides uh, what is serving the national purpose. And then if they decide how they want to fight, let's say, then it's going to be their uh, task to convince uh, NATO or whatever uh, international institution is necessary to be convinced. But uh, what I see possible opportunity is there are you know, missing capabilities or, or capabilities what have only a limited availability within NATO or, or in other you know, organizations. So if you can bring something new to the table which can provide answers or possible solutions in a future crisis problem, I think that would make it a little easier to make it acceptable for, for the international community. And that's, if you are asking me the next question, okay, give me an example, I will not be able to because, as I said, this is just a general framework. It, there are, uh, at the end of my, my research, uh, if you uh, have access to, to the book, you will see that I proposing eight or nine questions for future researchers to go into that details so they can either deny my theory completely or provide some more supportive uh, evidence uh, if it's you know, usable, not usable, if it's usable in Europe or it's usable only in the Middle East or Southern America or whatever. So I cannot give you exact examples, but I believe that you know, the, the difference, for example, in, in an alliance community, there are still going to be you know, conventional uh, capabilities. But if you bring something, not you, but if somebody, a small state, bring extra capability, something to add to that uh, community's benefits, I think it would be or could be acceptable. Yeah, bottom-up approach for sure, yes. Yes, sir. <coughs> My name is Klaus Wittmann. I'm senior fellow at the Aspen Institute in Berlin. And in my previous life, I was a general at NATO. And I uh, had not so much a question, but uh, uh, a few remarks. And I would uh, coach them in the form of three uh, personal reminiscences. In uh, April 92, there was a conference in Uppsala. <coughs> and as a colonel from NATO, I had the opportunity 
to give a lecture to the three defense ministers of the Baltic States, Junsis, Budgerichus, and uh, the Estonian one. And I, I uh, developed my ideas about how to defend, how to secure the security of the Baltic countries. And it, I said it must be multidimensional. And I'm saying that because I found your, uh, uh, your lecture very interesting. And I was also pleased as a German officer to hear Clausewitz quoted. <laughs> But of course, it was uh, totally centered on the military side. And I said to these uh, ministers, your security must rest on several legs. Own armed forces who make it painful for any uh, aggressor who uh, crosses the border without uh, invitation. Uh, cooperation with the Nordic countries in the Baltic Sea region, with the EU, with NATO, and in the CSE or OSCE. The West should make very clear to Russia, albeit not always publicly, that any encroachment on the Baltic state would catapult us back into the uh, Cold War. But also I said you must accept that Russia as a neighbor and as a partner, difficult as it is. Now we pursued this path and we partly failed because of the new Russian uh, policy, but I think uh, this makes your initial point against the network one needs to defend with the network. Secondly, in 2009, my first retirement remit was that the three Baltic defense ministers asked me to do an evaluation of the Baltic Defense College, which I did with a little international team, and we wrote a very critical report and made concrete recommendations, and that uh, led to a quite substantial reform of the Baltic Defense College. And, uh, one major point we made was that an out, as an outpost of Western military strategic thinking, the Baltic Defense uh, College should very much uh, concentrate on this point of small state security. And again, not only military, but uh, multidimensional. And uh, my last uh, reminiscence uh, in 2009, together with Ron Asmus and some others, and also a, a Latvian uh, uh, participant, we wrote a little six-page uh, paper titled NATO, New Allies and Reassurance. And uh, in January 2010, we had a chance to brief this to the Albright Group, who, uh, who prepared NATO's new strategic concept. And uh, it uh, led to a better rebalancing of collective defense and uh, out of area in the new strategic concept of November 2010 on paper. And now I look at this paper again, and it's eerily, thanks to Putin, it's eerily uh, uh, topical again, and in a hurry we are doing what we failed to do in time. Now what do I want to say by all that? In spite of uh, the trend towards hybrid warfare, I do not quite agree when you say uh, traditional strategies and hardware are no longer important. Look at how important, for instance, Russian tanks and rocket launchers are in eastern Ukraine. But in spite of that, I hope that the question in your title, how do small states defend themselves, must be answered uh, in two ways. A, not only militarily, and B, in an alliance. And the Baltic countries are very lucky that they use the window of opportunity to enter <coughs> NATO uh, just in time. Thank you. That's a kind of out of my, my lecture topic. <laughs> but if you could, please. Yeah, I, yeah right now I, I wouldn't comment on that uh, because I, I have to think through what you are you know, asking, basically. But uh, what I, I would say is, me being a soft officer and, and this idea is you can basically 
use the soft as, as, as the base for developing a, a new kind of, uh, you know, let's call military or defensive uh, organization or capability. Uh, <coughs> but uh, other than that, uh, from a NATO soft perspective, I cannot comment on that. Maybe another time, but not now. Yes. You are absolutely correct. The, the whole research was based on the, a, a military approach from a military perspective. So I didn't really uh, consider those factors, what, what you are saying. But uh, I would say again what I said at the beginning, that I would say anybody can be a weak actor as long as they perceive themselves in a possible future conflict with either with one country or alliance of countries or whatever, they could consider themselves as weak actors. And when they look at the possible future adversaries, they can identify that we are weak, and even on those factors, what, what you just described, and even choosing a separate or, or non-traditional approach to, to the military defense, they have to conduct, of course, some radical uh, rethinking reorganization. On, on the leadership and, and the other factors as well. But my, my research is, was purely from a military perspective. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Again, it's a very good question. I can give you my personal idea, but it's not really you know, related to, to, the, to the research. My, my biggest point is, and, and this is kind of uh, related to this, is I am personally, in going back uh, to, to the gentleman's comment, I, don't, uh, I believe in the international system very deeply, alliances and, and, and the whole community. But I always encourage everybody to have a plan B uh, in case of um, changes in, in international situation. And if your plan B is something self-reliable, self-sustainable, and meaningful in a possible future conflict, then if you don't have to use it, you don't have to use it. Because you know the, the international relationships and, and everything is is uh, ideal, beneficial, and it's working. But in the unlikely situation when something goes wrong, you still have to have something which can stand by itself. Anything else? Usually, uh, I got the end. the question is, uh, yeah, it's 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 a good idea, but. Uh, you can probably you should do it only next to the conventional military system. So you should introduce a separate doctrine uh, organization next to the already existing conventional military as a kind of supplement or augmentation for, for the conventional approach. And I always said that that's great. Do it if your national resources, environment, and interest allows that. But if you go to a country, let's call it country X, which cannot afford a normal and, and working military system, if you put in place another system, then you just take resources from, from, the, from, the, from the already existing conventional system, struggling with resources, with training, with everything, and you just divide it to two organizations. So instead of one bad thing, you will create two bad things. And when it comes to a test, both of them are going to fail. Anything else? Yes.
this one particularly interesting uh, from my perspective. Um, this uh, indirect approach, it's time consuming, right? Uh, For sure. Yes. And um, then uh, the question would be, this time consuming approach, well, to what extent uh, does this approach sort of feed uh, from the uh, behavior of your adversary? Because you mentioned that at the beginning, uh, the weak actor benefits from um, competent military leadership and also probably from strong political leadership. That, that's going back to, to the question over there. Uh, but, but then um, uh, this uh, possibility for the weak actor to win the conflict, does it depend on being able to recruit large numbers of local individuals who are really dissatisfied with the behavior of the adversary um, uh, or, or is this a crucial factor um, according to your uh, understanding or not? Yes, for, for sure, yes. Yeah, it, it, it's very crucial. That's, that's why uh, my first kind of finding was you need something very strong unifying factor within the society, either some a, a religious based or patriotism or nationalism. I, I don't like to use that word, but you, you have to have a force because it's time consuming. The society, the, the, the population has to be behind it because they have a crucial role in, in many, many, many factors, depending on how you design your, your, your system. And it's, it's really time consuming. But I always say, you know, what is better if you have a conventional capability, an enemy comes, like Yugoslavia, defeats the conventional uh, capability, overruns the country, and then rule your country or, or the country X for 50, 100, and uh, 600 years, and it's time consuming again to regain independence or, or sovereignty or whatever. So which more, uh, 100 years is more, or 10 years of uh, instant conflict? So. That's a decision somebody has to make if, if they want to be, you know, choose this kind of way. Because what I'm saying many times, that this one I'm suggesting is 95% of the time will happen anyway after the conventional defeat. Internal resistance will form, partisans, insurgents, whatever, small group of uh, populations are going to be uh, you know, dissatisfied, they will form some kind of resistance, they will conduct uh, sabotage, they will do whatever it takes, and then probably political movements are gonna come in 40, 50, 60, whatever years, it's going to happen slowly. What I'm suggesting is skip the conventional defeat part and organize, train, select, prepare the country for that war you are going to fight anyway after you conventionally, after Country X is conventionally defeated. Yes, sir. From, from this perspective, what I'm suggesting, okay, morale, morale is, the, is the number one because of uh, the, the crucial part of, of the people who, who are going to do it. It's going to be painful, it's going to be time consuming. They, they have to have high morale, they have to have that unifying force driving uh, from, from, the instead, from, from inside. Uh, training and, and, uh, and the tactics, I would put on the same kind of same level. However, training a little bit more because tactics can be uh, improved and, and developed uh, uh, based on uh, reacting to the, to the enemy's uh, uh, actions uh, throughout the, the, the time. So probably training to be able to adopt, to be able to you know, change, to be able to, to, be, to be flexible. Uh, morale, training, uh, and tactics. And then the equipment, as I said, self-sustained, self-reliance is, is very, very important. And, uh, did, did you have anything else? Sorry. Logistics and weapons. Yeah, logistics uh, is, you know, uh, again, uh, I think it was a German, but I'm not sure who said. Uh, amateurs talk about tactics and professionals talk about logistics. So logistics are always, always very important. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Thank you very much for that question. Uh, we, a couple of us, had a very interesting uh, discussion, uh, I think two weeks ago, along the same lines, because uh, I sat in a presentation when uh, the, the, the lecturer put up a slide with a, with a nice uh, table, and it says, peace, gray zone, and war. And personally, again, uh, as, a, as a researcher, I would say, Saying peace and war in the 21st century is, is not existent anymore. So when you're talking about peace, I believe that's a political utopia. Politicians would love to have that notion. And war, as you describe it, is a military utopia. We military people like to have a war when the civilian world and the, and the war is you know, divided and then uh, military people do what military people do and the civilians are just do what civilians are doing and everything is taken care of. I don't think it's that simple anymore. And the distinction and what you are saying is, you know, the switch between those two, I, I don't think it exists anymore. So the, the, the idea, of course, has many gaps. It's bleeding from many, many wounds. But I still believe that because of that peace war thing is not really that uh, differentiable anymore, I think it still have utility in, 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 a, in, a, in an environment and asymmetric war and total war, I believe those exist on paper now. And, and I don't think that the distinction is so hard anymore than, than what, what you probably describe. You are actually leading, leading into my answer. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. OK, then I will go so you answer. Yeah, actually, what, what I know is uh, if you're really interested uh, to further uh, kind of discover this, I really uh, suggest to go and try to find uh, resources from uh, the Swiss, uh, the Swiss National Military Strategy, Switzerland. They have some very, very interesting uh, ideas, even exceeding some of my suggestions. So I would really uh, suggest to everybody to go and, and take a look. And they are a neutral country. So it's very, very interesting how they approach defense. And being a neutral country, they are saying, yeah, we are neutral. But if somebody's coming, they will pay the price very hard. And then the details, it's, it's in, their, uh, in, in their strategy. And also, there is a country I can tell you, I cannot name the country. But I can tell you that uh, I recently uh, saw a study of, of a country preparing uh, itself for 2025 and before. And basically what they did is they are looking at possibilities how to implement something like this 
parallel to the conventional, existing conventional forces. But the, the interesting thing is they are putting more emphasis on the non-traditional ways of, of, of defense and keeping the conventional force more like uh, balancing out their international requirements or, or whatever. So it, it, it's, it, I think it's very interesting. Of course, they are not following word by word my, my thing because it's, it's just, as I said, a general framework. But uh, it looks like there are either examples already exist, like, like Switzerland, and there are some countries who, who are, uh, re at least on paper, they, they're considering something, but as I said, parallel to the already existing conventional system. So they are not uh, at the point when they would say, okay, we give up everything what we had previously and then just go with this new thing. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, you are going to be a very good politician <laughs> because uh, at, uh, at a certain place and time when I briefed uh, some political uh, leaders on, on my theory, they actually uh, raised these two exact points, what you raised. And I said, yes, I cannot uh, really uh, argue with the, with the first point. It's, again, your problem. I, I mean the political problem, how to, how to solve it but still believe that if you don't have anybody to fight, you still have a better chance to take an indirect approach than when you try to fight without people using tanks, artillery, everything, because you have to train those people on, on certain things, complex, you know, military hardware, whatever. So it's even more difficult. And the other thing is, <clears throat> it came up, uh, the second point, uh, one gentleman uh, said exactly that, it's a great idea, I really like it. He was really you know, ex uh, excited about it. But he said, it's a political suicide. You cannot, you cannot do that. It doesn't matter you know, how much danger you are, it, it, you cannot do that. And I told them, I think again it's how to frame, frame the question. Because yeah, it's very easy to say we cannot defend, the military cannot defend. But if you put that way, we have a new way of defending and then you educate people and, and you, you know, the strategic communication, the, 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 the way you advertise it, the, the, the way you sell the product, again, it could, I, I'm not a politician, I will never be, but the, I, I think they could do it if, if they really want. And it's interesting because three years ago when I did this research and I had to brief a, a couple back in Hungary and also in other, other institutions, some people were really interested, you know, some great ideas, maybe they can think along and, and go. Some people said, yeah, yeah it's, it's political suicide and, and it's no time and whatever. And now we are in 2015, things are changed in the international, uh, you know, uh, chess table. And people getting to be more and more interested, even those who told me in 2012, it isn't worth the paper you wrote in, they actually put me on agenda to speak to people in, in different things. So it's, it's very interesting how the interest and the way the possibility changes when you know, the, maybe the outside threat or, or the international environment changes. So for sure, I, I, I share all of your concerns. I'm just saying there are times and sometimes possibilities, opportunities when that might change. Anything else? Yes. <coughs> It is a very nice study you did, but I'm wondering, seeing that 
in the 21st century, more and more we're having not against a direct country to the free port, but instead against a group around the world, for example. And I'm wondering whether or not the tactics that you explain in your research would apply also to a small country fighting against a um, non country or the extremist group. And maybe um, you could also explain whether or not the endeavor strategy would be something a coalition of country can use in their, um, let's say, defense against such an extremist Thank you very much for that question. I, again, I, I think that you are right. If that new organization or new doctrine, the, the new way of thinking about defense and understanding defense, the, the requirements of the 21st century defense, if we, if we do it right, then this approach could be useful for whatever adversary we are facing in, in the future. Because uh, I strongly believe that, uh, you know, for example, a comprehensive approach is floating around just like hybrid warfare, a very fashionable word, uh, without really anybody capable of explaining what do we mean. And if you go from country to country or institution to institution, there is a different uh, definition for comprehensive approach. So I think what I'm describing is a kind of comprehensive approach, but taking it much further. Com combining things together, understanding it, and making the, the steps to, to, to be able to you know, use it against uh, either a conventional or an outside country to country enemy or any other kind of enemies. If you are properly understanding the 21st century threat and if you properly build the, the new way of thinking and then you build the organization, you take the, the, the right technology to it, then you can have an approach that uh, can address multiple, multiple threats in, in, in the 21st century. And what was the second part of the question? Sorry. I can tell you my, my gut's feeling only. I, I, I think we could do it, but uh, I don't have like uh, academic uh, you know, evidence to kind of support my, my, my feelings. But uh, I encourage you to dig into the, the, the question and, and maybe you can do some research on it. But my, my gut feeling is for, yeah, for, for, for sure. Certainly, it, it would be useful. Military people, I'm trying to uh, get rid of you. I'm trying to make uh, you lose your, and myself, to, to lose our, our job and to, to get another job, actually, in the new organization. So you should throw me bombs right now. No bombs, no bombs. Uh, <coughs> thank you very much for your attention. Uh, my name is Walt Salzalmich, uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, as, as you are, transporting for National Defense Academy and actually uh, taking command there. So my question would be, you said that to find the network, you need to build the network. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, also, you said that, uh, uh, that uh, well, you didn't say that, but that's obvious. <laughs> uh, small state like Latvia, we are part of alliance, uh, uh, NATO, and we are kind of uh, relying on NATO in terms of being defended <coughs> if time comes. So, Find the network, you need to build the network. We are part of the alliance, so we rely on the alliance. If you would be secure, let's assume, um, do you see the 
Oh, thank you. Am I clear? Yeah, yeah, yeah you, you're clear. I, I, I have a couple points on, on that. First of all, uh, NATO is the biggest and strongest military alliance in the history of mankind. So I strongly believe that you know, every small state part of NATO, of course, has to stay in, in NATO and be, you know, they, they have to trust in NATO and, and all that because, because NATO is the greatest thing ever in, in, the, in the military history. What I'm also suggesting is what I, I told earlier, personally, I would always say to have a plan B. And when you are rewriting a national military strategy or, or doctrine, I think you have to take a really, very hard look on what you have. And if we have to do it by ourselves, is it sufficient? Is it going to do it or not? If it's not, then you have to have a, a, a good plan to do something else to, to be able to defend the country by, by yourself. That's from a national perspective. From a NATO perspective, NATO is facing many challenges and is designed as a traditional conventional you know, military alliance. So I think those who are rewriting those, uh, those concepts, they have to also take a very hard look on, on the 21st century threat and they have to address the multiple threats uh, of, uh, of, of the possible uh, you know, future conflict. What I don't believe is, I don't believe ISIS and Russia should drive it. I think our capability to look into the future and the, and the past, to analyze the happenings, to analyze the 21st century, should, drive, should kind of drive us towards a common strategy for NATO which addresses multiple threats, not only the two existing ones, for example, right now, but, but the multiple threats. NATO is the big player. It should not be afraid of you know, uh, the outside players. It should go its own way and should kind of address multiple, multiple things. So when, I, when you are asking uh, the land forces and all those doctrine, they have to have the adapt adaptability, they have to have flexibility and not only the doctrinal side, but also on the organizational side. And the problem is NATO is 28 nations. So when you are saying, okay, NATO, then you are affecting 28 different nations as well. So it's very hard to kind of implement changes at, at that level. I think to a certain extent it's necessary, but it's the national kind of plans which has to be the, the focus put on. But flexibility, adaptability, and, and just looking at, at the 21st century threat and, and go along with that. And that's the point that I meant, that for, for NATO as an alliance to protect, <coughs> as, as being an actor consisting of 28 different nations, uh, how you, can you build such a network, whatever it, it would be, addressing whatever threats in the future, how can you build that network to fight them? That's again a million dollar exactly. question. Right? That's, that's, you know. yes, sir. If you want to comment on that, yeah. Could also add one little remark there. In uh, comments on the new strategic concept, I said uh, and I wrote that uh, apart from these three core tasks collective defense, crisis management, and cooperation. I would have added a fourth one, and I would have made consultation a key task in the Alliance, taking account of what you have just said, uh, that uh, it is difficult to uh, pull together the views of 28 member nations. NATO is doing a lot to address the 21st century threats and the multiple uh, threats which you uh, mentioned uh, and the, constant, the, the connection between non-military threats and real security threats, etc. etc. It has even uh, in terms of, in, in the main of the adaptability which you uh, call for in the structural field, it has even created a new division, emerging challenges, uh, uh, emerging security challenges division in the international staff. But what I find lacking is that all 
security challenges are really discussed at the NATO table. There are certain uh, uh, very prominent security problems which never reached the table of the NATO Council. Why? Because, first, NATO is always afraid, or the Allies are always afraid, that if they differ, then the press will say NATO is on the verge of breaking up. And the other worry is that uh, they fear that uh, dealing with the subject at the NATO table, for instance Iran, gives to the public the signal that NATO is about to intervene militarily, which is not true. I would think in the way of what you have said, consultation would be very important. It's in the NATO uh, it's in the NATO treaty, by the way, Article 4. It should be revitalized. NATO should not be afraid of, uh, of public uh, uh, reactions. And uh, to signal this, to signal this necessary change of uh, the uh, debate culture at NATO, I would have elevated it even to be uh, a fourth uh, core function of NATO. But they don't <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much.